millions of bored feet of white pine. The Red Cedar River, both highway and engine for the transportation of people, materials, logs, and lumber. Beautiful, powerful, and incredibly useful. Andrew Tainter was one of three principals in Knapp Stout, the largest lumbering company in the world at the time. The Red Cedar River watershed included hundreds of thousands of acres of the finest white pine in the country. Andrew Tainer, who was probably the only man of the four men really involved in the formation of the company, who knew the logging industry. The others were out of towners. Captain Wilson was a failed uh, steamboat uh, ferry operator in Fort Mass and Iowa, run out of town because he owed money. John Holly Knapp was a nice, sweet little boy who had knowledge of money and how to use it. But it was Andrew Tainer who uh, really came here two years before the others had come and worked on the river. He knew the logs, he knew how to handle men, and he worked for a time in the little village of Irvington. And then he left uh, his partner, Blois Hurd, and he started another operation on the mouth of. Varney Creek, a mile down below Irvington. But when the boys that started the Knapp Stout Company were running into a little financial trouble, they were using some of Tainer's uh, expertise and they owed him some money, so they asked him to join the firm. And he is really the true guts, I think, of the Knapp Stout Company. From its headquarters in Menominee, Knapp Stout controlled the Red Cedar River. Sawmills, dams, holding ponds, flour mills, shipping, more mills, and millions of logs. Early in his life, Andrew Tainter pioneered reliable steamboat travel on the Red Cedar River and the Chippewa River. Thereafter, he was called Captain Tainter, and the memorial includes references to this early chapter. By many accounts, Tainter was fluent and inventive in French, English, and Ojibwa. He liked sharp, well-maintained tools and workers who used their heads as well as their hands. Andrew Tainter believed that agriculture would succeed lumbering as the economic foundation of northern Wisconsin, and he used his stock farm, Oaklawn, just to the east of Menominee to introduce scientific farming to the area. Oaklawn had the first Holsteins and Hereford cows in Wisconsin. When his marriage to Mary Goose Poskin ended, he took their five children and hired Bertha Lucas Leisure to care for them. A year later, they married. Bertha Tainter was a voracious reader, religious skeptic, and strong feminist. She read medical journals and became a popular healer, midwife, and general medicine woman. Bertha held seances and presented programs on such topics as voluntary communism, clairvoyance among friends, the healing powers of music, and the natural superiority of women. Mabel's older sister Ruth died at the age of eight. Ruth is the one on the left in this portrait. In June 1886, Mabel Tainter died at the age of 19. She was refined, studious, a talented musician, and according to most people, a modest young woman. Perhaps even more than the grandeur of the memorial, the Tainter cemetery plot tells us about them. Here, on Andrew's left are three of his Ojibwa children. William, six years old. 
Julia, 10. Lizzie, 33. On Bertha's right are Mabel's twin who died at birth. Mabel, Ruth, and Fanny. 30 feet to the south is the Maxon family stone. Reverend Maxon had his office in the southwest tower of the memorial, just steps away from the balcony seats of the theater sanctuary. This view of the theater is from the Rose Room Tower, a favorite place for gathering during intermissions at concerts, lectures, and plays. Across the auditorium is the Blue Room, where Reverend Maxon greeted the members of his congregation after Sunday services. Through his office window, Henry Doty Maxon could see the construction of the Stout Manual Training Institute. One of Andrew Tainter's business partners, James Huff Stout, started the school to provide the technical foundations for new industries in the Menominee area. In a letter to a former colleague, Reverend Maxon described how he enjoyed his new office in the memorial. As I sit here by the fireside, I hear a visiting theater troupe in the auditorium, rehearsing for this evening's performance. In an hour, I shall go home to dinner, and then Ada and I shall stroll back here for the troupe's performance of Faust. Tomorrow, I shall be here to deliver a sermon on the importance of balance in one's life. Henry Doty Maxson had only a little more than a year to enjoy his new office in the memorial. He died suddenly of a stroke at the age of 39. During his Sunday school lesson on the day he died, he had written on the blackboard this line from a Hindu prophet. He who has caused no fear to the smallest creature has no cause to fear when he dies.